So just what am I celebrating? Well, you know that I love New York. And you know that I love New York history. And you know that history is cool. Well, <laughs> I would say that we have perhaps the definitive purveyor of cool, literally, with us today. A gentleman who hails from the area that was initially tagged as Pavonia when first settled as a Dutch patroon ship back in the 1630s. The area that we today call Jersey City, New Jersey. With ambition in his heart and great musical passion in his soul, this young man and his brother came across the Hudson River as teenage jazzy acts and proceeded to launch an unparalleled career that would include breakout hits Jungle Boogie and Hollywood Swingin' in 1973 and 74. And he would soon become a bit of a Hollywood swinger himself when he was suddenly right there in Rocky Balboa's apartment in 1976 and then right there on the dance floor with John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever in 1977. But then that Hollywood legacy would be eternalized in 2015 when his remarkable musical group received its own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And with this young man now in his seventh decade of paving musical pathways through realms charted and uncharted, including a brand new album that is quite awesome, by the way, a new tour, this man, as his music declares, is fresh. He continues to get down on it because his life and career is a never-ending celebration. His 2021 album, Perfect Union, blends half a century of soul, rap, pop, and even a little Carlos Santana influence, if my ears do not deceive me. This ambassador of international goodwill is bridging the gap, generation to generation. He wants to live in a world full of peace. He sings about upholding the constitution and embraces the priceless value of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And you know, with messages like that, I'd say we can all get on board that voyage. So, Damas and Eric, Madame and Monsieur, Damas y Caballeros, ladies and gentlemen, I am profoundly honored as I am excited to present you with the master of iconic dance party arrangements that are veritably woven into the fabric of our culture. Just as amber waves of grain and purple mountains majesty are an indelible part of our American experience, now so are timeless anthems like Too Hot, Ladies Night, get down on it. He is not only an American treasure, but he has essentially guided the way we smile, the way we dance, the way we groove, the way we celebrate. This Grammy award-winning icon is nothing short of musical royalty. And he is New York's very own, Robert Cool Bell, co-founder of Cool in the Gang. Welcome, sir. Hey, Chance, how you doing, man? <laughs> I'm excellent. How are you? You really just laid out my history there. Well, I, just a little bit of it. And I, you've got a <laughs> lot of <laughs> you've got a lot of history. Um, cool. I, is it okay if I call you cool? No problem whatsoever. Yeah, you, you, I really enjoyed looking into your history. I, of course, I'm a huge fan. And I was a musician, and I, I gave it up when I started seeing bands like yours or even bands emulating bands like yours. And I said, no, dude, you, you got to find another profession. And then I went into acting. I said, yeah, that's more along my, my, my abilities. But you have, a, you have some origins in some areas that I'm familiar with. Uh, you grew up in... After moving from Youngstown, Ohio, you, you grew up in Jersey City. Yes, sir. And music has a funny way of weaving its way into your history because your father was not a musician, but he was something else. That's true. My father, Bobby Bell, he was a, a top five featherweight a boxer. He, uh, 
what uh, some of those featherweight fighters at the time. Uh, um, and um, you just go back and forth uh, to Cuba and you should run into a lot of the different musicians before they had the sanctions on Cuba. You know, Dizzy Gillespie and, uh, you know, Miles Davis and all those guys used to go down, the, down to Cuba and perform down there. Yeah. Now, Miles Davis, uh, I, I believe your father had something to do with guiding his career path to some extent. Was he a bit well, confused about which career he was going towards for a little while? Well, my, my, my father uh, used to be at his apartment uh, up around the uh, 66, 67 area where they have Avery Fisher Hall and everything. Well, he used to be a, a boxing ring there and, uh, and uh, apartment buildings over there. And uh, so Miles uh, would come by the ring every now and then and want to spa with my father. <laughs> and my father said, man, I don't want to do that because uh, I hit you in your lip the wrong way and, you know, it might, uh, you know, mess up your career. <laughs> and that's how that's how it started, what, you know. What, what was, why was Miles messing around with boxing? What, what, why wasn't he just... I think that's all, that's something that he always wanted to do. You know, his movie, there's a part of his movie where he's boxing. Oh, really? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 the Miles Davis story, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, somebody did a you know movie on him, and they, he's in the ring boxing. But your dad had a heck of a career. Your dad had well over a hundred fights. He was really in it for better part of twenty years. Yeah, yeah. He and uh, my uh, my uncle uh, that went to uh, New York, uh, and uh, my uncle he fought the uh, Sugar Ray, yeah, Robinson. Now at that time, his name Tommy Bell. Tommy Bell. Yeah. He and my father, they went to New York together. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know that. I, they had that controversial fight. Uh, and uh, at that time, you had to knock the champ out. You couldn't win on points. Right, right. And people are saying today, you know, yeah, Tommy won that fight. But, they, you know, they gave that fight to Sugar Ray because, you know, he didn't knock the champ out at the time. Wow. That's amazing. Your father, your father fought uh, Jesse James Leha's father also, who, who was named Jesse Leha. And I'm sure he must have been a good fighter because his, his son was a phenomenal champion at uh, featherweight and lightweight. But anyway, I, th I think that's really interesting. And but but your father didn't guide you into boxing. He he he. Did well, he, he, he tried for one year. <laughs> oh, did, did he really try? Uh, well, I was uh, I was about nine or ten years old, and we were up and living in Elmira, New York. And it used to be this youth youth club. Uh, down the street from the uh, project that we were staying at. And uh, so uh, I guess you would call that a little Pee Wee League. He had me, he had me box for one year, you know. And uh, uh, this guy was like well, twice my size. I said, no, this ain't for me. Now, uh, I gave him a good run. I mean, it was only three rounds. I said, I ain't, you know. I said, I don't think I'm gonna be a boxer. <laughs> Listen, three rounds. Is a lot. I've done it. Okay. I've been in there. And, you know, you get in there. Three rounds seems like an eternity. Yeah. And, and yeah, the truth comes out. You know, you start to, I boxed a little in the amateurs and it's a truth. It's a, it's an experience of truth. You find oh, okay. things out that you can't find out other ways. Right. 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 Yeah. It's an incredible, it's an incredible experience. Well, that's, that's, that's fascinating. Um, now, you also have, as I mentioned, you, you have these threads. Music weaves its way into your life early on. You have a godfather uh, who's a bit of a musical icon as well. Could you tell us about him? Yeah, Thelonious Monk. That's around that same time period. Uh, that apartment uh, building uh, across from the, the gym, Thelonious Monk, uh, he, he lived there. And my father lived in that apartment. So they became friends. So... Yeah, when I was born, my uh, my father asked that the lawyers would be my godfather. So this was just about proximity. He was near the gym. He knew of the gym and knew there therefore knew of your dad. And he and Thelonious Monk became friends. Yeah, stayed in the same apartment building. Wow, amazing! And and you, does that have something to do with you becoming a professional musician? Well, um, kind of yes and no. When I was born, my mother was in Youngstown, Ohio. 
And uh, uh, he told my mother, he said, I want to name, I was Bobby Bell Jr., Robert Bell Jr. He said, right, also, he right. came up with another name. He said, I want to name him Dodo Monteroso, Ellery <laughs> Kiko. Now, and he was a, a, a keyboard bass player, Cuban, keyboard bass player. It's a, great, it's a great name. It's just not one I would have come up with. Yeah, it was so long, you know. <laughs> But uh, but he didn't know. Um, well, I was gonna become a bass player. That was right. I guess he knew these guys. Like I said, a lot of musicians hanged out. I was hanging out in Cuba, you know. And uh, he named me uh, after a bass player, and I became a bass player. Well, there's so there's definitely something there in there. It, it, it's something got to your soul early on. You felt oh, yeah. it. Um, I learned about the story later, though. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, right. but of course, yeah. But you had influences from people, clearly. I mean, Thelonious Monk was your godfather. You, you, you were close to people who were in that business. And frankly, you know, boxing and music, you got to have, you got to be in touch with your soul in both of them. You know, uh, I've done a little bit of both. And if you're not in touch with your soul, you're not going to be good at either one of them. So I can imagine there are some threads that, that, that connect those, those, those lives and careers. Well, if you look at um, the young uh, hip hop world, different guys coming up in the hip hop world, you know, um, they uh, gravitated towards uh, Mike Tyson's, you know, uh, and all, all, the, all, all the fighters, you know. Yeah. So let's go back to when you're coming out of Jersey City, New Jersey, and you and your brother, Ronald, Right. Venture out as teenagers. You you were 14 years old, I believe. Right. When you started your music career as jazzy acts. And that makes sense, knowing who your godfather was and that, that yeah. guys like Miles Davis were hanging around. Um and then you started performing as the jazzy acts. Uh, just a, a little. I mean, um, again, my 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 brother Ronald was into uh, uh, John Coltrane. Uh, Dennis uh, Thomas, he was uh, into Cannibal Alley, George Brown, Philly Joe Jones. I was listening to Ron Carter. You know, uh, Spike Mike Spike Mickens uh, was listening to uh, Freddie Hubbard and all those guys. Yeah, but we started after the Jazz Jacks went to the Soul Town Band. Right, which was based on Motown, essentially. Right. So you're already making, we already see that evolution out of jazz, and not, not so much out of jazz, but transitioning into a blend of the Motown sound. Yeah, because uh, there was an organization in Jersey City, and they called themselves the Soul Town Review. Now, they were trying to be like the Motown Review. And we became the Soul Town Band. So we had to learn a lot of these Motown uh, hits and records that they were, they were singing. So as a band, we had to learn how to play yeah, Judy on the Skin Deep, The Temptation, Open Miracles, all the different Motown. And of course, James Brown, he wasn't with Motown, but the, James Brown was another one, the guy about it. Yeah. But I guess you know that story. We were going to that part of it all. So... Yeah, so you and you were playing some James Brown. I don't know if as the Soul Town Band you were playing James Brown, but you eventually were playing some James Brown numbers. So we play a lot of uh, when we did our own live sets, the Soul Town Band. We would play, uh, you know, a lot of James Brown. Okay, you know, when you knocked on the door at Cafe Wa down on McDougal Street on the corner of Minetta Lane, what 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 was the band? What were you guys calling yourselves at that point? Well, at that time, we were, uh, well, that was before uh, Soul Town. We were caught like a Jazzy X. You were, you were still the Jazzy X. Yeah. And so, what was that scene like? What was it like in Cafe Wa? Uh, did you deal with uh, Manny Roth when you were there? Yeah. Uh, I think um, after that, because, you know, this is another story that you know, goes into uh uh, David Lee Roth. David Lee Roth family uh, has something to do with the cafe one. Right, that's his uncle. Okay, yeah. Yep. Did you ever encounter David Lee Roth there? No, he was, too, he was probably too young at that point, right? 
Yeah, but you know, we ended up doing 48 shows with Van Halen. And it was David Lee Roth was the one that said, I wanted the cool in the gang to be on a uh, reunion tour. Okay, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. So you did you did 48 shows at Van, Van Halen where? All across America and a few in Canada. Oh, I didn't we were know doing that. The, we were doing the uh, um, uh, the Glastonbury Festival in London. And uh, uh, on that week, it was Coldplay and uh, uh, a few other uh, rock, rock groups, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, so David saw us uh, on the BBC. And he was checking, checking us out. And uh, of course, we, we kind of rocked that crowd, you know, with rock groups. Right. So he called up... Um, Alex uh, and Eddie, he said, well, I got the perfect group that can uh, not open for us to be our support act on this reunion tour we're getting ready to do. Right. And so they said, well, who? He said, cool in the gang. He said, man, what you been smoking? Cool in the gang. <laughs> he said, man, I, they're here in London. They just rock a rock festival. I want cool in the gang on the show. So he went on and started telling me, he said, when we were coming up, we used to play funky stuff, Jungle Boogie in the clubs out in LA. And he said that in the, in the 80s, you guys had to hit celebration and we had jump. And he said, 60% of my audience are ladies. And he said, so let's go out and have a party. And that's what we did. <laughs> that's that is the perfect combination, honestly. <laughs> you guys in Van Halen, you got it all right there. I mean, that's a party. That is awesome. Did you enjoy it? Oh, we had good fun. Yeah, yeah. That's that's yeah. Fun. that's beautiful. Uh, tell us about Baggy Studios back in the '60s. Um, I guess this would be the late '60s or maybe '69, '70. Yeah, we. Um... Rehearsed there off and on and, and baggies. But the story about baggies was that uh, the record company uh, came to us and said, listen, you guys uh, been having some territorial hits like, you know, Funky Granny or Funky Man, you know, Philadelphia, Connecticut, New York area. He said, but we have a guy that we want you guys to work with and uh, produce your next record. We said, who? He's the guy that did uh, Mongo the Bongo. Uh, so Makusa. So we, we had one meeting with him and we weren't really feeling him. So we went into Baggy's studio about eight o'clock in the morning. And by 12 o'clock, we had created funky stuff, Hollywood swinging, and Jungle Boogie. All right, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, our back was against the wall. We were just jamming. <laughs> okay, record company, we don't like that guy. We're going to show you what we can do. <laughs> All right, so you created, you recorded those three songs on the same day. Yeah, we were just grooving all day. <laughs> My God. And and those, those came out on the same album, correct? They came out on the Wild and Peaceful album. Wild and Peaceful, right. Yeah, on the same album, you're right. Yeah. So you're, you're 23 years old, 20, 22 years old, I think. And you've got three top 10 hits going. Yeah, Hollywood Swing became a big hit, Jungle Boogie and Funky Stuff. Now, Funky Stuff was uh, a bigger hit on the R&B side. I think we stayed number one on the charts about well, seven weeks on the R&B side, the Funky Stuff. Yeah, but they're all iconic songs. They're all like, you hear them, and you're like, oh my God, yeah, there it is. What What did that feel like? When, so, I mean, I know you, you'd been a musician already for Goodness, like eight years or, or more, like a pro, but yeah. now you now you're on the radio. Now you're everywhere. Now people are really hearing your name. Um, you're cool yeah. in the gang. What 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 was that like? That was a great feeling, you know. Uh, I mean, uh, to be on that level to have those kind of hits. I mean, like I said, we were territorial. Some people like uh, you know, live at PJs, we did live at PJs before that. Uh, we did uh, live at the sex machine, but it was a wild and peaceful album. It took us to the top uh, around the world with those, those, those records. That was really the breakout album, Wild and Peaceful. Get down, get down.
feel the funk, yo. Let it flow. about the discography a little bit because your first album it not a lot of vocals on that album not at all <laughs> it's called <laughs> it's just called cool in the gang great rhythms great sounds but it's uh it's an instrumental essentially yeah we had the uh, ch tranquility uh our very first record now the cool in the gang record uh went top uh top 40 the song the cool in the gang record which was all instrumental and some people thought we were a, a Spanish band or something because it was congas and, you know, the horn thing and just a little talking on it. Hey, cool. I saw your lady last night. On yes. Saturday. That's what I mean. There is some, <laughs> some vocals. You guys are jet, you're rapping, you're talking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And then what, what was the, what was it that it, was it the Motown that, that inspired you guys to, I mean, obviously, I add the vocals, but there was there was a uh, more of a what would you call it that you added to it that made it approach the the the, the jungle boogie in the in the funky town and and yeah that kind of stuff. You no, know, like like chance stuff, you know, uh, the, on those albums, like uh, you know, Funky Man or Funky Granny or or, or songs like Good Times, uh, even uh, another instrumental was called NT one of the most sampled songs of my catalog because they like uh, uh, the drums on there. And uh, that song, we, uh, we created it. We didn't have a title. So what are we going to call this? They say, let's call it NT, stand for no title. <laughs> Speaking of, of being sampled, you guys are, as far as I know, if you're not the most sampled band on earth, you're you're darn close. I believe you are the most sampled band on earth. In fact, you guys even, I've heard you talk about sending out Sample Patrol, or you had to do that oh, to, yeah. for a while, right? Well, Mr. James Brown, he's the one that said, well, cool the gang is number two. He said, I'm number one sampled band. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but 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 he wasn't a band. That's James Brown. Right. But James Brown did have a funky band. We used to play all his music, man. Oh, yeah. I I think that I, every every live band, every party, every band that I've ever gone to at a party, I think in their heart they all want to sound like Cool in the Gang. If they could just nail like what what's the one band you guys really want to sound like? If we just sound like Cool in the Gang, everything's perfect. <laughs> you guys just have that party dance sound that that's just it's unparalleled it's just incredible you know uh chance uh you got a point there it's coming out of um 69 our, our first single came out uh july 3rd 1969 <laughs> Of course, it was a, 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 a top 40 hit for it. But a lot of the backup bands that was backing up groups at that time, maybe like the Delphonics or the Intruders, or, they kind of left and created their own band. They said, well, cool, you gotta get good. See, we ain't no back y'all up no more. <laughs> we'll create our own sound band. A few groups uh, started from that. 
in view of and in spite of all your success, you, you guys really stuck together. And, and I mean, to your credit, you your band is made up of, was comprised of guys from the neighborhood, right? In Jersey City, for the most part. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we um, we started off with, uh, actually seven, one guy named Willie, Willie Sparrow to play with for me about a year, but uh, with seven members uh, to school in the game. And um, one of the things that our families told us is always stick together, you know, as a band. And it came down to the last, um, well, year and a half, there's only four of us left. George Brown, Dennis Thomas, my brother, uh, Ronald Police Bell, and B.T. Thomas. So now it's only two of us left, George and myself. But you have a, a real connection um, and love for family and just loyalty of, of your, you know, the, your people who've been with you, your, your bandmates, your, your friends from the old neighborhood and so forth. And I know that your, your brother was not just co co-founder of Cool in the Gang with you, but he was also very involved with um, um, cultivating new, new acts and yeah. helping along new, new performers and, and not so new. I mean, going back to where he had a lot to do with launching um, the, the, the Fuji's career. The Fuji's, yeah. Right? And yeah. That's, that's, that's going back a little bit. That, that, tell me about that, please. Well, I mean, um, the, the Fuji's uh, was recording uh, out of a uh, house of music uh, over in West Orange, New Jersey. And uh, my, my brother saw them and uh, um, he started, you know, became friends with the Wyclef, who was pretty much the leader, and, and Proswell, and of course, Lauren. And uh, he started working with them. Uh, they called themselves at the time, uh, the Rap tra Translators. Translators, yeah. And the Translator like crew. Yeah, because there was a rock group, that was Sony, <clears throat> called the Translators. Okay. So we couldn't, they couldn't use the Rap Translators. So they started off with the concept of Refugee, Fuji, they from Haiti, I mean, wake up, I think, from Haiti. And uh, that's how they came out with the, the Fuji's. That, how important is that? I mean, you, you sing about it, you write about it on the new album, uh, passing that tradition generation to generation. I want the good life, no more living strife. I want the dog, the kids, the house, the wife. I want to live in peace and tranquility. So please don't bring bad news to keep. Cause everybody mad even if the day's sunny Pissed off, funked up, stressed out over money They say it can't buy you love Yes it could I see it going on around the world in every hood How you living, making bad decisions Or how you sketched out or stretched out Laid up in prison You as small as you desire Big as you aspire So let's get back on track Flat tire Keith Murray ruling the game What's fucking with that? Fuck rap, pop, soul mixed with rap uh -huh. We bringing it back, uh -huh. we bridging the gap Generation to generation, now that's the facts And I wanna live in a world full of peace If you do, then pull up a seat I wanna live in a world full of peace The color of skin, it just don't matter Let's get along and let's get better I wanna live full of love, full of peace Life, let it sentiment how important is it for you to pass stuff down generation to generation to teach and cultivate new new performers well that's something that um, we always did you know uh, as uh, we were young too as we were coming up you know uh, teddy rally teddy rally used to hang around with us and he, he learned how to play the keyboards for hanging out with cool and gang and you know he went on to be a, a big producer he even produced uh, you know michael jackson um and then um uh, other groups we uh we found uh, color me bad uh, uh i was doing uh we're doing a tour called it's cool to stay in school and then uh at the time my, my late wife had came up with a, uh with a foundation called the cool kids foundation yes and she wanted to keep music in school so why come there's not music in the schools like it was when we were coming up. So anyway, she, she formed the, the Cool Kids Foundation. And uh, we did a tour with Cherry Coke. And uh, one of the things that was the tour 
uh, these different schools, uh, you would be able to come and meet Cooling and we do a meet and greet. As long as you know you're doing good in school, doing uh, good, you have a good track record, and you know stay on top of you know the, 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 the your teachings, you know the academic, the mix. And uh, um, it's Oklahoma. I think it was uh, also Oklahoma. These three guys they came up to us and they said, "Well, no, we we we're good. We're staying in school. We got good grades." with that academics and et cetera. So we want to sing something for you. So, okay. So they sang three uh, acapella songs. And so my cousin, uh, who's also still managing, managing me now, I'm been working with me now, cool the game. He, uh, he sent them up to my other cousin in New York. And he worked with them for about four or five months. And that group became Color Me Bad. Wow. It was a Jack Swing movie. Uh, Wesley Snipes, and uh, they used the song "I Want to Sex You Up." Came a huge, and they uh, and purposely they didn't put their, their their picture on the front cover of the album. It was just color me bad. And then when they found out that we had three white guys and one Spanish guy <laughs> <laughs> singing them songs, so that was another uh, group that we found. And then another one was. Uh, more on my cousin's side was uh, Pink. Pink was with, was with a group in Philadelphia. Pink was working, I think, uh, one of the Wendy's or one of them. And one of the guys that followed our team, uh, you know, uh, uh, saw her and said, hey, you got a uh, young lady that, that can sing a little bit, you know, we're gonna put you in the group. And uh, they did. Uh, and the uh, producer and owner of the, of the label, LA and Babyface said, well, I gotta tell you guys, that's your winner is Pink. Wow. Her name was Lisa. He said, I don't know what you gotta do. Work something out with the mother two girls, but she's gonna be your star. That's amazing. And, you know, pink, pink is pink today, you know. So you guys really you 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 clearly, in addition to being an iconic group yourselves, you you you've your whole group has focused on being aware of the next generation and the, right. know, bringing up these other people and helping people and along with the cool kids foundation which is just a, a fabulous effort and, and a fabulous endeavor uh, on behalf of your 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 wife and and i think that's a beautiful thing to be putting your energies into cool that's that's so meaningful it really is yeah well we, you know that was uh, her dream and we're pushing it on and uh we uh we we do golf outings. I have a good friend, uh, Mr. Goldberg, and uh, yes. we just had our second annual golf outing. You know, with uh, with uh, with OJ, uh, Anderson, and uh, you know we we're, we're looking to do our third one, and uh, it's 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 uh, it's, it's it's something that she's smiling down on us about because now we see it it's growing. The last no. one, with Ja Rule, uh, Chris Tucker. Of course, uh, LT and you know various uh, football players. That was a part of it. That's, Along with OJ, of course. Yeah. That's that sounds like it's it's a bit of a party. I could imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's fabulous. Um, who's rapping with you? Who's rapping at the end of Pursuit of Happiness? The a guy go by the name of Keith Murray. Okay, that's not your son. Your son runs the foundation. Yeah, but he's also on. He's yeah, my, my son is into, uh, he's on the album, um, along with, uh, he uh, collaborated with uh, Walt Anderson. So we have um, a royalty on there. Uh, my son worked with uh, Walt Anderson, and of course, my, you know, my brother before he passed. Uh, 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 Too Sexy, a song called Sexy. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, uh, uh, Walter, uh, uh, Walt Anderson, and uh, also my brother. So, and, uh, then, and he and they got another one out, they did together. It's not on the album, but it's called So Impressive. I, I'm really, I'm really amazed and I really admire the way you keep these, uh, your, your, your career endeavors, how you involve your family and your close friends along the way and how you've never wavered from that. And as I said, you're in your seventh decade of doing this stuff. And 
it's really just as a family man myself, I just really am uh, um, impressed by that. And it's, it's just beautiful to see. And it, it, it clearly comes out in, in the work that you do. And, and I was noticing the other day, all you got to do if you're in any kind of a bad mood is turn on Cool in the Gang. <laughs> you just can't help smile and sing along. It's just, it's, it, it's clearly that the spirit in your soul comes out in your work. And I think that's just an incredible accomplishment. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. I want to mention a couple of your other ventures. Uh, there's one behind me. Tell us about your champagne. Okay. Well, maybe three to four years ago, I'm touring in France. Uh, we have about 20 shows, sold out shows in France. So the promoter comes to me and said, listen, I'm doing a uh, champagne on the late Barry White and uh, he had a Barry White lookalike and one of the Bee Gees. I said, oh, he said, uh, would you like to also, you know, um, you know, uh, start a champagne on this tour? I said, well, you know, um, I don't think my fans will want to be buying uh, bottles of champagne after my concert. They want t-shirts, caps, stuff like that, pictures. I said, but what I want to do, I want to get on the shelves. So he said, oh, I said, yeah, I want to be on the shelves. So I came up with this idea, idea uh, uh, with the name Le Cool Champagne. Because I wanted it to have a uh, French vibe that was coming out of France into America, almost like the Eddie Murphy movie, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so we meet um, the, the people up in France in Champagne country, uh, the family, the Bertolo family. Now, Eric Amore uh, had been in and out in the wine business a little bit, you know. Uh, he's also involved with uh, uh, Nikki Beach, Nikki Beach uh, uh, clubs around the world. And so we came up with the name uh, Le Coup Champagne. We cut the deal with the Bertolo family. And I wanted to build in France first and let it come to America. Of course, you know, with the pandemic, slowed things down a little bit. But now, you know, we're, we're out there. We're getting out there. We're going from state to state. That's not, not like the record business. You got to get an OK in each state. Yeah. yeah. yeah <laughs> and check now it starts to pick up. Yeah. So hopefully uh, 2022 will be a good year for us, you know. I'm sure it will. And and tell us a little bit about the tour, the Perfect the tour, Union tour. We, um, we're just starting up. Uh, we have Back to France again in June. In June, July, we're doing uh, seven shows there. So what, what, what happened, Chance, a lot of those um, dates that we had was, was canceled and pushed yeah. back because of COVID. So now we're trying to pick, uh, pick, uh, pick back up again, you know, uh, for next year. I mean, we were doing the um, Singapore Jazz Festival. We were doing the uh, Australia Rock Festival. We were doing uh, Japan. All of that fell out. Hmm. All of that fell out. So now we trying to get back in there, but hopefully we'll be working on it. We do have one in uh, February uh, at the Ocean uh, Ocean Resort in Lac City. Okay. Uh, we, we're doing that. Um, at the same time, uh, on my downtime, I've been promoting Le Coup Champagne. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you're a man who likes to stay busy, cool. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I'll do it the old school way too, because I go to some of these markets. I, you know, I, like down here in Florida, Georgia, I go up to Georgia, Savannah somewhere, and I go in there and, and, and take a bottle of champagne. They don't know who I am until I tell them, I say, hey, taste it and see if you like it. <laughs> when you find out, tell me that you like it, not because, not because it's me. They turn around, they order five or six, seven cases. I said, well, hey, my downtime was my uptime. Hey. Have you a nice cold glass of the cool champagne? <laughs> you 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 could do anything cool. You could sell anything. You're a salesman, buddy. <laughs> you're doing it right. You're doing it right. Listen, cool. You are an incredible piece of our remarkable history. You are an American treasure. You are musical royalty, and frankly, you're one of the nicest people I've ever met. Okay. Um, you're welcome. I thank you so much for for taking this time to to talk to me and. Tell us about what's going on with you and your incredible career. And um, I, I just, I, I'm just so grateful for, for this time. And uh, God bless you Thank and your you. family. 
I'll say one more thing. Uh, the yes, Saints, please. Uh, my good friend that just lost to the Atlanta Braves is Dusty Baker. We have a project called Cool Baker Energy. And we're doing projects over in Africa, you know, dealing with solar energy. So he and I and uh, uh, Ken Griffey is my cousin. <laughs> so Ken, that's on the sports yeah. side. Yeah, my Ken father. Gri Ken Griffey's your cousin? Yeah. My goodness, what a family line, <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. So we'll be doing, uh, hopefully, uh, doing some things in um, Africa next year. To, uh, again, it depends. So we'll, we'll sure. see what happens. Yeah. Well, you are a guy who knows how to stay busy and knows how to put his energies in the right direction. And uh, it is it is an absolute honor to be able to meet you and, and speak with you. And I, I wish you all the best in every, every one of those endeavors, sir. Well, thank you. I look forward to seeing you again. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much and happy holidays to you. Okay, thank you again. Bye-bye. Well, is that about the finest gentleman you could ever want to meet? The album is Perfect Union, the champagne is Le Cool Champagne, and the foundation is the Cool Kids Foundation. Robert Cool Bell, ladies and gentlemen, co-founder of Cool and the Gang. What an incredible human. Thank you, sir. Vedante. Folks, if you're enjoying Island Voices on YouTube, please be sure to hit the red subscribe button to get every episode. Now, Damas Anir, Madame and Messieurs, Damas y Caballeros, Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to delve deeper into the history of Manhattan, the incredible history of Manhattan from 1609 to 1909, then you must join us for our primary podcast, Island, available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and all major podcast directories. Climb aboard. History is cool. Folks, thank you so much for joining us, and we remind you to listen to our voices. They are the indomitable spirit carried in the interminable winds that remain with us forever and continue to shape and define this incredible island. We'll see you next time. What you gonna do? Do you want to get out?